How's it going everybody? This is Beat the Bush. Today we're going to take a look at this Vatcher Power 48 volt battery. You might hear that, well, 12 volt is not as good as going to a 48 volt system. All the serious solar and battery backup systems uses 48 volt these days, but why is that? Let's say you want to pass 100 amps. Voltage times current is equal to power. So 12 volt times 100 amps is 1200 watts however if you bump this up to 48 volts 48 volts times 100 is 4800 watts now you're using the same wire it's like magic all of a sudden you can pump more power through it and all this without increasing the wire size you know wires are very expensive these days why stop at 48 volts why don't we do like a thousand volts instead in the future it might increase in voltage yet again, maybe double it or something. But there's a certain limitation with the electronics and also the insulation of the wires themselves. A lot of times they are only 600 volts. When you increase the system voltage from 12 volt to 48 volts, all the cost of your wires reduces dramatically. The little cable lugs is cheaper. And even within the devices, the internal wiring becomes cheaper. However, there's also a slight disadvantage because when you increase it to 48 volts, it becomes slightly more dangerous because there's a higher voltage. When you move over to a server rack battery, it becomes cheaper per watt hour. And I know I've been saying 48 volts, it's 48 volt nominal. Right here, it's 51.2 volts. Why the heck it's a little bit more than 48, right? That's because the nominal voltage of each internal lithium iron phosphate cell is actually 3.2. Now, the voltage varies around a bit. When you completely drain it, it can go all the way down to 40 volts. And internally, there's actually 16 cells in series, each 3.2. So 16 times 3.2 is 51.2 volts, what it says here. Some older rack mount batteries will only put in 15 cells inside these things. So 15 times 3.2, so it's gonna have a nominal voltage of 48 volts. When you have one less cell in there, with all things equal, it's gonna have less capacity, of course. With that said, let's take a look at this battery. I gotta be careful with this thing. It's glass underneath, 103.3. Any heavier, let's say they want to do 200 amp hour, 48 volts. You don't want that. It'll be a 200 pound monster. You'll need two people to lift this. You got two screw positions so you can daisy chain them. You can parallel a couple of these together. It has a built in fuse. This one's the Delisi Electric 125 amp fuse. If you disconnect this, it will be disconnected from these terminals here. The front handles are swivelable. It doesn't go this way, only outwards. And then on the side, you have the rack mount holes. When I had the 12 volt batteries, I have to buy an extra battery balancer if I want to convert it to a 48 volt and I have to buy a circuit breaker, an external one. It's also not as nice. It's not fully contained. You got wires flying everywhere. It could be a safety hazard. Although right here, you know, it's still a safety hazard because you could go and touch these things. But certainly much, much less wiring hanging all around. Each of those 12 volt batteries is around $500. This thing right now is going on their website for $1,300. You do need to move on to a 48 volt inverter as well. Any serious solar or battery backup system uses this 48 volt stuff. Let's see what's underneath. We've got some foam here on the lid, insulating plastic here. Whoa. They have an in-house built 100 amps, 48 volt BMS. This little character is string. It's also the same character you use to describe a stick of meat. And there's a UART output. This is relatively a slow protocol. So you have all the smarts in this wireless card and this is taped and glued to the bottom of the enclosure. When you put a wireless card inside a metal box, the signal can't get out very well. We have two eight gauge wires and the red ones are actually six gauge wires. It's just enough for 100 amps. When they're really, really short cables, you can get away with smaller gauges. The only limiting factor is you don't want them to burn down. They do have a 125C heat shrink. If you run it for 100 amps for long periods of time, maybe drain the whole thing, I'm gonna guess 
it might go over this heat shrink temperature. The wire itself though, it's 200C. The red one is also 200C. So the cables themselves are very good. Certainly less beefy than when I tear open the 12 volt batteries where it requires a 200 amp BMS. It just looks so cool. I just really like this stuff. Each battery goes from here to here. It's a square prismatic cell. There's a little piece of metal that makes it a little bit narrower on both sides. This is just used as a spacer and also for it to have these screw holes so it can hold the battery down. Close that back up. Did I mention don't try this at home? There's a lot of dangerous things about this. These are 100 amp capable. As soon as you short across one of these, 100 amps. 48 volts from here to here. Now I gotta make sure not to accidentally reverse it. Nah, just kidding. Look at that. This is so cool. It has screw terminals on it, so you don't have to go around doing spot welding or anything. You just get these nuts and the plates over here, bolt them together and they're connected. No welding necessary. These are actually grade A EVE batteries. EVE is a large manufacturer of EV batteries. This is automotive grade. And if you try to buy one of these, it's actually 70 some dollars on the internet. By the time you buy 16 of them, well, it's the price of the entire thing. However, if you're trying to build one of these and you buy these in bulk, it'll still cost you about $1,000 to $1,100 to buy 16 of these in quantity. So a pretty dang good deal, I think. There's a space between each of these batteries, a very, very narrow space. Let's put it back. These are vent holes, no barcode or writing or anything until you remove this, then you can see the barcode here. And all these just snap into place. It's kind of like Legos. There are two temperature sensors, one right here and one down here. Both are hot and cold sensors. And these are just by metal sensors. There are two bars that goes across here and here. And if if you flip them over, it's actually a vent hole and it'll come out through here and on the other side. They take care not to cover up these vent holes. Remember, don't try this at home. I'm an electrical engineer, so I know what could potentially kill me if I accidentally touch them together. When I look at this, I see a lot of danger because if you touch any terminal and short it out, boom, you know, lots and lots of current. It's very dangerous here. There's no BMS protecting you. So when I'm screwing this terminal to the positive terminal, you could have used this and go in there, right? But it would get way too dangerously close to the other terminals. So that's why I need this extension here. And then we can close that. When I was putting these plates on, you have to be very careful. If you accidentally, instead of put it vertical, you put it horizontal, something bad could have happened like that. This is super dangerous over here. I don't recommend to do this. It uses a lot of similar screws. There's not too many different ones. Like in a laptop, there's like 10 different kinds of screws. Everything around the perimeter and on the outside uses the same exact thing. And so this makes it a lot easier to take apart and put back together. Now we can test one of the temperature sensors for hot and cold. First, we'll do a cold temperature test. Oh, there we go, it turned off. It says minus 36.4 degrees. Okay, let's heat it back up. It's minus five, zero degrees. Everything turns back on, this is great. This charge cuts off at 131, so let's use a heat gun on this. Okay, I finally tripped at 171. Naturally cool down and see when it comes back on. Oh, it came back on. Low temp, high temp checks out, it works. I have the light drawing 40 watts and the inverter draws about 50 watts and when the inverter is on, so it's about 100 watts. This thing is 52 times two amps, that's 100 watts. The temperature, 66.9, it dropped back down. Time to empty, 46 hours, 90% full and you've got page two. You can enable or disable discharging, enable or disable charging, max temperature, min temperature 100 amp hours this whole battery went through one cycle so far page three tells you all the voltages of every single cell which is really great green highlighting the highest voltage cell blue highlighting the lowest voltage cell the low temperature cutoff is different for charging versus discharging charging is zero degree c and this charge is minus 20 c 
Let's take the little temperature sensor here again, and I'm gonna cool it down carefully when I get close to 32. Oh, 31. Okay, yeah, it turned off right at 32 degrees, except it went, it shot over with this little can of air duster. Low temperature cutoff works for charging even as well. When the temperature's back up, it starts back up charging again. Remember that screen over here, we can turn off the charging. If we don't wanna charge it, just push the button, 23 amps, it goes to zero amps. Maybe sometimes you don't wanna charge the battery. And you have the same thing for this charging. You can turn on and off this charging if you want. So now it goes back to charging again. Get the Xiaoxiang electric app. Looks like a fairly small application. It says stay to charge here, so it's a little different than the capacity that's remaining here. Technically, it should say 92.5%. It tells you the volt, the current, the power that's being charged into it, the high and low voltage of any of the cells, the voltage difference between those, the average voltage of the cells, and cycle index, which is how many times the whole thing has cycled through. It shows a couple of temperatures, four of them. There's probably two more internal ones on the circuit boards. And you can also see the cell voltage. There's a history of your current volt, the capacity in amp hours, and also the temperature. So it allows it to charge and discharge MOS is on. Balance can show on and off, which means it tries to balance charge the cells. Protection is off right now because none of the temperature sensors are out of range. The RF range of their original placement of the Bluetooth module is actually shorter by around five paces or so. So I'm just gonna put it where I wanna put it, right behind the display. Cell over voltage protection kicked on because it's fully charged and it turned off the charging ability over there. And the highest voltage on one of the cells is 3.62 volts. So that's pretty high. Now we can begin discharging it. And then I actually don't wanna waste the electricity. So I'm gonna plug my fridge into it and whatever else to try to discharge it. My fridge over there and the plug, the other end of the extension cord in there. See how long it'll run. Push the fridge back. 165 watts. And it says 221 watts here. About 56 extra watts it's being consumed with the inverter being turned on. When you run these things, you gotta take that overhead into consideration. If you have a really small solar array, it's gonna eat up a lot of it. So let me do a time lapse on this and then we can see it drain. My inverter stopped drawing power from this device because it's low voltage. I was able to get 102 amp hours out of this, so capacity verified. We can actually check out how much current these guys are actually using. And it says 20 milliamps. That's around one watt and I ran it for 16 hours. That's 16 watt hours. Relative to this 100 amp hour, right? We got 102. It used up 0.3 amp hours of this battery. Even though it was on for 16 hours to do this measurement, it was negligible enough so that it doesn't show up on this 100 amp hour capacity test. The LCD actually does not have to stay on. You can turn off the entire battery and then turn it back on, the LCD won't turn back on, and then you can use the battery that way. Thermal glue, quite expensive. It's like 10 bucks for this little tube. And just squeeze them in there, bend it down like that, so try to push downwards. I decided to vacuum seal my tube. Hopefully it won't dry out by the time I need it again next time. Now we are ready to put everything back. If you're gonna build any kind of storage system, 48 volt is definitely the way to go. You don't have to crimp a lot of wires. You don't have to buy an external battery balancer. The 16 cells all have their own balancing wires. And so you get a little bit more value when that's built in. You have an LCD screen, you have wireless connectivity via Bluetooth. You also get a built-in fuse so you don't have to buy an external one. And there's room for upgradability. You buy a rack and then you buy more of these and connect them in parallel. I'm using two gauge wires here for 100 amps. And internally, two eight gauge is about 16 millimeter squared. Six gauge is about 13 millimeter squared. But my two gauge wires here is actually 33.6 millimeter squared. When the wire is very, very short, like inside the battery here, the voltage drop is not gonna be that much. But then there's a limiting factor here. 
the heat shrink is 120 C and the insulation to the wires is 200 C. So when you continuously pass 100 amps through those double eight gauge wires or that six gauge wire, it better be under 120 C so it won't melt that heat shrink. That's also probably the reason why they put that fiberglass shielding across those wires because it's gonna get very, very hot inside. Overall, you're paying a little bit more for the enclosure the wireless connectivity and also the screen and the circuit breaker. If you guys are interested in this product, check out my affiliate link down in the video description below. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time.